Hello everybody! Happy Tuesday morning and welcome back to ROM Storytime. If this is your first ROM Storytime, my name is Sarah, I'm a science teacher at the museum, and I'm really excited to be able to share a really special book with you today. And the way that ROM Storytime works is I will read you a book, and the book that we choose each week is our choices inspired by something at the museum. And then after we read the book, you have a chance to ask me questions about so any of the things that we covered in the book or about the museum. And then I give you the creativity challenge for the week to let the book inspire us to go and create something new. So I'm really, really happy to see everybody coming back and joining us who was here last week. And welcome to everybody new. And without further ado, I am going to share the very, very special book that we are reading this week. We are reading Burton and Isabel Pipistrel Out of the Bat Cave. And I think it's going to become obvious really, really quickly why we chose this book. But let's see how long it takes you to figure it out. So let's dive in to Burton and Isabel Pipistrel. In a deep, dark, and damp cave, where the drip drops of water sound like music and rough rocks hang like works of art, a family of pipistrel bats gathered to make their roost. The pipistrels had yellowish and brownish fur that was fluffed up around their ears. They flew like dancing butterflies. They were a tiny bunch of bats, and the tiniest of them all was a bat named Burton. And there he is right there. I love his shirt. I love bugs. I love bugs too. Bugs are awesome. Burton wasn't like the other pipistrels who always stuck together. He had a curious mind and a brave heart. Burton usually poked around the roost when the other bats were off hunting for insects or fast asleep upside down. He liked to stay up late in the mornings, daydreaming of new caves and hollow trees to explore. Every night, Isabel said, hurry up, Burton, there will be no bugs left. And when the black night melted into day, she hissed, get to bed, Burton, the sun will be up soon. Isabel followed all the rules and was always on her best behavior. One foggy night, while all the bats were out scanning trees and skimming ponds for a delicious dinner, Burton noticed something strange. A small stream of light poured into the cave from behind a puzzle of rocks. It's not morning yet, thought Burton, but what else could it be? Confused but curious, he decided to take a closer look. I have my ideas, but I'm curious what you think that strange light is. He squeaked, shrieked, and screeched at the beam of light. The pipistrels use echolocation to locate and identify things by listening to the echoes of their own calls. But all Burton could hear was the echoing sing-song sounds of the water in the cave. So he decided to squeeze his furry little body right through the narrow wet rocks until he popped out the other side. Oh, I don't know if any of my friends out there have been playing Animal Crossing like I have, but if you have, you recognize this fish right there. That, my friends, is an oarfish, and I think I know where Burton is. Let's see if I'm right. Aha! Looking around with his tiny heart pounding, ba-boom, ba-boom, Burton sat frozen in fear and wonder. Maybe I should turn back, he thought. What would Isabel say about this? But he took a deep breath, stretched his wings wide, and charged ahead with all his might. I don't know if you can see the sign behind him, but it says the Bat Cave. And I know where that is. He flew along the soaring ceilings of a wide marble hall and into a gleaming glass gallery where he came face to face with a gigantic Tyrannosaurus Rex. Old skeletons of dinosaurs stared down at Burton. He zipped around the great long neck of a Barosaurus whizzed over the bony tail spikes and plates of a stegosaurus there he is. and swooped past the sharp horns of a triceratops. There he, is. Oops. he imagined a world where dinosaurs stomped around and roamed free more than 65 million years ago. He fluttered into another gallery that looked just like an old pirate's buried treasure. 
Shiny cases and chests of drawers were loaded with pretty gems, precious pieces of gold, minerals, and even meteorite specimens. He was fascinated by the sparkle of deep blue sapphires, crystal clear diamonds, and sea green emeralds. I've never seen rocks like this before, thought Burton. Isabel will never believe this. Burton found a quiet gallery that was filled with glittery ball gowns, delicate gloves, and fine silk dresses displayed next to bright puffy jackets and embroidered suits. He dove into the sleeve of a soft coat and pretended to be a powerful prince. He wrapped himself in a heavy purple dress and imagined he was swimming in an ocean of grape juice. He curled up inside a lace glove and thought he was trapped in a spider's web. With all the excitement, Burton completely lost track of time. It was almost morning and the sun was starting to rise. There was much more to explore, but he had to get home. Burton turned to make his way back to the roost, but he wasn't sure which way to go. He frantically flew through all the same twists and turns, but it was no use. He was lost. With each passing minute, Burton grew more frightened. What would Isabel do? Suddenly, he remembered. Echolocation. He let out a few small shrieks and heard them bounce back, but none of the echoes sounded familiar. Burton nervously flew left and right, up and down, side to side, and around and again. How would he ever find his way back home? Tired and terrified, he collapsed in the vast silence of the empty space around him. I wish Isabel were here, he thought. Just when the morning light was breaking through the night sky, he heard a faint, far away, and familiar drip drop. Yes! Burton recognized the watery string of sound from the cave and triumphantly sang a sequence of calls that echoed through the galleries. He navigated the invisible map of drip drop echoes back to the Pipistrel roost. So he went through the textiles gallery, around the minerals gallery, through the dinos gallery, and back home to the bat cave. He slid his way back through the narrow rocks and hurried into the cave just as all the Pipistrels were dashing in from their nocturnal hunt. Burton, where have you been? asked Isabel. He eagerly told her about his amazing adventure and all the dinosaurs, treasures, and costumes he had discovered. Oh, Burton, you really let your imagination run wild this time, laughed Isabel. When will you stop daydreaming and start behaving? For a second, Burton wondered if he had imagined the whole wonderful night in the museum. As he settled upside down for the day, he could hardly wait for the next nightfall to find out. Now, I think you have already figured out why this book is so special to us, but this book was written by two workers at the ROM, people that I work with. It was written by Denise Diaz and it was illustrated by Tara Winterhalt, and it's all about galleries at the Royal Ontario Museum. And not just that, this is Dr. Burton Lim, who's a bat scientist at the ROM, and this is who Burton the Bat was actually named after. So while your grown-ups are typing any questions you have about our story into the chat, I'm going to show you some bat facts that Dr. Lim shared with us. So number one, bats are not blind. In fact, they can see better at night than humans, but humans have better daytime vision and can see colors better. Most bats have echolocation, a sonar system that helps them to fly in the dark and sort of see with their ears. Bats are the only mammals that can fly. The bones of a bat's wing are like the bones of a human hand, and the bones in the wing are like the long finger bones, and the little claw in the wing is the thumb. Bats can eat from 50% to more than 100% of their body weight in insects each night. And that is a lot of insects. 
All right, my friends. So if you have any more questions about this book or about the museum, please, or bats, type them into the chat or have your parents do it. And I'm going to share with you the places at the museum where Burton actually went while they're doing that. So the first place, obviously, is the Bat Cave. It's a model of the St. Clair Cave in Jamaica where our scientists actually did a lot of research on bats. And it's one of my favorite places at the museum. Once he left the Bat Cave, Burton went to the Dinosaur Gallery, and that is my second favorite place in the museum. If you've ever been to the museum and had a lesson on dinosaurs, you might have met me there because I teach a lot about them. Now from there, Burton went to the Tech Gallery where all of our rocks and minerals are. There are so many amazing, colorful, shiny, weird things in that gallery. I could spend the entire day in there and still not see everything. And then the last place that Burton went was the Harris Gallery of Textiles. And this is a really interesting gallery because it changes all the time. So when Burton went there, they probably had an exhibition of dresses like the Dior exhibition that I have up on the screen. But you never really know what you're going to see when you go into that gallery. Now, I see that we have one question already, which is, why do bats sleep upside down? And there are a number of reasons for that. Number one is that the caves where they live, there is a lot of stuff on the bottom of the cave that you wouldn't necessarily want to be sleeping in. There is a lot of water, there are a lot of bugs, and if you've ever taken a dog for a walk, you know exactly what animals do after they've had a big meal, and there's a lot of that on the ground as well. Now imagine sleeping in that. So they want to sleep up high and they're sleeping on the roof of the cave, but they're hanging on by their feet because their hands, their arms, are the things that they fly with. They're made for flying, not for hanging on to things. So if you like take your hand and you hold your hand out and you imagine stretching your fingers out to, I can't even fit it all on my screen right now, that's kind of what the bat's wing is like. And then their thumb is this little tiny thing up at the top. There's actually a really good picture of it with Burton and Isabel. Let's see. Here we go. I'm going to switch back to our book for a second. All right. So if you look at Burton here, we can see there is his arm. There is his palm, I guess. And then he's got these fingers. And it looks like he's only got three fingers. But if you look really closely, the second finger is right there. So that is... One, two, three, four, and the thumb up at the top. So in a bat's wing, these two fingers are usually really, really close together. So if you're drawing a bat, that's kind of the best way to do it. So if we have no other questions, and if you don't can't think of a question right now, that's okay too. Up on the screen right now, there is the contact information where you can send us any questions that you have and we'll answer them, either me or one of the specialists at the ROM who knows all about the amazing things at the museum. Ah, why are bats nocturnal? So that is a great question. And the answer is not all of them are. There are some bats that are out during the day, but bats that eat insects that come out at night are the nocturnal bats. And they're really, really well adapted to hunting at night. So like Dr. Lim shared in our bat facts, bats, they see about as well as we do. But if you've ever gone out in the middle of the night in a really, really, really dark, dark, dark place, then you can't actually see very much at all. So finding an insect in all of that mess is really, really difficult. Especially if, like a mosquito, if you've ever seen them, they can fly around, they can move really quickly, they can change direction, so can moths. And that's what the echolocation is for. So if you think about our ears, our ear is actually this teeny little hole right here. This bit around the ear is called the pinna, technically. But if you were a bat, it would be about mm, that big. So the ear is like a giant satellite dish focusing sound back into the ear. And if you've ever seen pictures of bats, they often have these kind of really strangely shaped giant noses. And that's basically doing this. It's like a megaphone to help them project sound. So they make these tiny, 
high-pitched sounds. And here's an experiment for you to do at home, especially in the spring as it's raining all the time. Wait until after a rainstorm when there's lots of puddles, but the storm has to be over because the puddles have to be completely still. If you drop a rock into that puddle, what do you think you're going to see? You're going to see some ripples. So here's a fun experiment. If you've got a good pair of rubber boots on, put your foot into that puddle and wait until the water is completely still again. And then drop a little pebble into that puddle and watch what happens when the ripples hit your foot. Now sound moves through air almost exactly the same way those ripples move through water. And when they hit something, they bounce off of it. That's an echo. And it's those echoes, that sound bouncing off of things that let that paint that picture of what's around them at night. How often does the ROM change exhibits? That's a really great question too. And it depends on the exhibition. Some of them are designed to be there for a long time and some of them are designed to change. Now galleries like the textiles gallery change a lot because a lot of textiles are really what we call photosensitive. And that's a really big word that means sensitive to light. Light can damage them, light can fade them. You don't want to take them out into the light very often. And that's why galleries like the textiles gallery will change so often. Galleries like the dinosaur gallery, Fossils are fossils. They have been fossils for millions of years. They are pretty sturdy. They're a lot more long-term. How many babies do bats have? Now that is a really good question too. And I don't know the exact answer, but here's a really fun thing for all of you grown-ups and people who are just really interested in bats. On Thursday morning, we will be doing an Ask Rom Anything. It's where you get to ask Rom scientists anything on Instagram. And Dr. Burton Lim, our bat specialist, will be there. So you'll be able to ask him any more specific questions you have about bats. So depending on the species of bats, they might have more, they might have less. But the cool thing about the bat cave at the museum is there is actually a special area where the bats in the bat cave have their babies. It's the nursery, and they keep them all there so that they're safe. And when bats are born, they don't have fur like the adult bats, so they're tiny and they're pink, little bright pink baby bats. Oh, my favorite bat species. How do I pick? There are so many amazing bats. So of all of the mammals on Earth, so all the mammal species, those are the hairy things like us that have fur, about 20% of mammal species are bats. And there are so many different ways that bats live, and there are so many cool things that they do. But I think one of my favorites is the bumblebee bat. So it is, I think, the smallest mammal on Earth. There's a little bit of back and forth about what actually you consider the smallest. But it's called the bumblebee bat because it's the size of a bumblebee. And it will do in its environment the same thing that a bee does. It goes from flower to flower, drinking nectar and pollinating the flowers. So a lot of bats eat insects, but not all of them do. Some of them drink nectar, some of them eat fruit, some of them eat meat, and a very, very, very few species drink blood. And those are the vampire bats, which are also very, very cool. All right, so it is time for our creativity challenge for this week. So for this week, we were inspired by the light and the dark that Burton travels through. And for our creativity challenge this week, we're going to tell our own story in light and dark in a shadow play. Now, the story that you tell is entirely up to you. If you need some inspiration, one of the things that I always wondered is... Burton gets to go on this great adventure, but Isabel stays home in the Batcave. But what if Isabel gets to have an adventure? What would she do inside the museum? So maybe your story that you want to tell is about Isabel's big adventure. But if you have another story that you really want to tell, do that one. It's up to you. It's your creativity challenge. But we're going to tell it like a shadow play. Now, shadow plays have a long history. They have been performed in Central and East and South Asia for thousands and thousands of years, and their popularity made them spread across the world. But here is the basic setup. You have a bright light, and then you have a screen in front of you. So you're between the light and the screen. I had to use my action figures to act this out because there's just me at home and somebody had to hold the camera. But you have your puppets between the light and the screen, 
and then somebody recording your shadow play on the other side. And so what that ends up looking like is this. So again, my action figures had to help me out, but the closer you are to the screen, the sharper the shadow you're going to get. And the screen that my action figures are using is a paper towel in between my salt and pepper grinders, but something like a sheet between two chairs works just as well. So think of a story that you want to tell, and you're going to create your way of telling it. So I use just an old folder, and the great thing about a shadow play is you can make mistakes when you're drawing, and nobody's going to know because it's the shadows. So you make your puppets, or you could use the action figures, they've got a great shadow as well. Or you could just use your hands to tell the story. Record the story and share it with us at Rome Toronto, hashtag ROM at home. And I really hope that I get to see some creative, inspiring stories from you this week. Because I know, my friends, from talking to you at the museum, that there is a lot of creativity out there for us to share. So we will be back next Tuesday with another very special book about, I talked about the bumblebee bat as one of the smallest animals on earth, or the smallest mammals. We'll be reading a book about one of the largest mammals on earth, and I'm really excited to share that one with you as well. So thank you so much for joining me. And just before I go, there is one last thing that I want to share with you. We have a new home on the web, rom.on.ca slash storytime. So you can always go there and check on what the creativity challenges were from earlier weeks. You can see the story that we told if you missed it, or if we're not allowed to share that story after the live broadcast, you'll get a summary from me telling about what the story was and all of the ways that you can share the story and ways to be able to take home the story as well. So if you want to take Burton and Isabel home, there is a link in our video description about how you can get this book to add to your library. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining me this week, and I hope to see you back next Tuesday. Bye, everybody!